Good evening. Uh, welcome to the regular Board of Education meeting on 11 4 2021. Uh, the board's coming out of closed session. Uh, thank you for being here in person. I do want to uh, call the order, uh, Superintendent. Mr. Short? Here. Mr. Reed? Here. Mr. Hoover? Here. Mr. Clark? Here. Mr. Huey? Here. Ms. Gow? Here. All are accounted for. Thank you. Great. We'll move on to the Pledge of Allegiance. And uh, I do want to invite Bryn Hinsmeyer. Is, can you take the lead for us, please? <clears throat> Pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic of which it stands, one nation, under God, individual, liberty and justice for all. Thank you so much. <clears throat> uh, we're, uh, <clears throat> we're on item five, reporting out a closed session, Superintendent. There's no action to report out of closed session tonight. Okay, thank you. Moving to um, item six, adoption agenda. Do I have a motion? I'll move it. We have a first by Mr. Clark. Do we have a second? I'll second. Second. And uh, you take roll call, please. Mr. Short? Yes. Mr. Reed? Aye. Mr. Hoover? Aye. Mr. Clark? Aye. Mr. Huey? Aye. Ms. Gow? Aye. Motion carries, 5 0. Thank you very much. Um, Moving on to item seven, this will be the public participation. And under pu uh, public participation, this is the time uh, given to speakers <clears throat> at discretion of the board chair. The law allows the public to address the board on any matter not on the agenda, and but the law prohibits action by the board. So we will limit it, I think, to three, three minutes, yeah. <clears throat> we have... Uh, Two speakers. The first one would be Paul Kiefer. Good evening, uh, Board of Trustees and Superintendent Kalogian. I'd like to thank uh, thank you for your uh, staff visits and uh, and to our resource centers uh, that was recommended by the board. Uh, I also would like to thank uh, Dr. Huber for inviting us to discuss business for New Pacific School. As you know, we are proposing a site-based school with New Pacific School. This is different than our current independent study operations and will increase our student contact tenfold. New Pacific School is not a replication. It's a new type of school offering an alternative for kids who don't fit into the traditional public schools with the strength of Pacific Charter Institute behind it. Thank you to the staff for your thoughtful questions and we're looking forward to working with you as we all are trying to reach the goal to reach all the students in, in Rancho Cordova. Uh, we have been uh, doing continuing our outreach and uh, we did participate in the trunk or treat uh, last weekend and this weekend we'll be uh, also uh, doing outreach in the community. As others are uh, struggling to find their place, we're hoping that uh, New Pacific School will be a place for those struggling to have a place that they can call uh, their school. Please know that my door is always open and certainly I appreciate staff uh, reaching out when there are questions and uh, I want to thank you for all your considerations and have a good meeting tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next is Stan Jones. Moved to Rancho Cordova in 87, and they gave me a hat for volunteering at uh, Mills Middle School. Um, that was where four of my children, my four children went through. And now I have grandchildren going through the same school where I was a volunteer until COVID canceled it. Um, Something I haven't heard discussed, one of the things that, uh, I was last here on March 12th of last year, which was the last meeting before schools were closed. And uh, Carrie Kay was uh, uh, at an item and the board can only make a decision based on from, they can only make decisions now for the future. They can't do anything about the past. So a lot of the analytical stuff that is on YouTube and otherwise is opinions largely based on the past. One of the things, so I thought about the, some of the past, and one thing I, I wanted to say was that my, uh, my student at Mills is very pleased that uh, this board, the district, and Nurse Kay and her staff 
um, had COVID shots in vaccinations at Cordova High School. And I think it was also done at Folsom High School for that end of the community, which was really great. When I was her age uh, in middle school, entering middle school, we had another thing going on, which was called polio. My wife graduated, went to a one room schoolhouse in the Santa Cruz mountains in a rural community. Two of the students in her class, these are elementary kids, contracted polio. And for those who don't know or don't remember or are too young, uh, you end up with leg braces if you're lucky for the rest of your life. My, uh, I was adopted into a family. There was a family across the street. The mother there of five children uh, permanently made us, me a part of the Miller family. Um, she contracted polio uh, about 1950 and was lucky to have felt for the rest of her life. She was grateful that she survived and she had no visible um, issues related to it. So when COVID comes out and, and so at that time in elementary school, we didn't have, um, sh um, we didn't have masking, we didn't close schools. But when I entered seventh grade in PE, we got the safe, uh, salt vaccine as a shot at school. And um, a couple of years later, Dr. Sabin also uh, came out with his, which uh, for those of us old enough, it was a sugar cube. It was administered in a drop. And the joke is that if you, did you have your sugar cube today, meaning that you had your, your, your shots. And I'm appreciative as a parent that we are, this board, taking proactive steps to the best you can, making the forward decisions that have happened over the last year and a half um, to help keep us safe in this community. And I know the decisions are hard. And uh, anyway, thank you, my time is up. Thank you. Next is uh, YK. Long time no see, because <laughs> this morning. Good evening, Mr. President and the members of the board. Uh, my name is YK Chalam Charla. I live in 177, Abbeyville Court Folsom. Uh, you know, I always want to take an opportunity to come and thank you, and also the management team and our leadership team. Uh, my kids were with Mr. Delago when they were growing, and uh, we had a wonderful time and celebrating the diversity. So this town is, you know, so much into let's bring together and enjoy and celebrate. And today has been, it is so happened, November 4th, uh, Indian American Community Diwali Lights Festival. It is so happened, and you're all sitting there. Before my wife's turned on the lights, I said, I got to go and do one important thing at the school board, coming and thanking all of you to allowing the diversified cultures, they dress up and the way they you know, do things. And especially, I know uh, Ms. Hemington at the Vista de Lago High School, that international days and bringing and celebrating. I'm sure that is across all 35 schools in these districts. I want to sincerely thank you for allowing us and doing and celebrating together. Thank you. Thank you, YK. Do, do you want to speak? Yeah, yeah. good afternoon. We, I'll give you some more time. Yeah. yeah, respected school board elected leaders and staff. Uh, thank you for all what you have been doing and exemplary service to the community for the past few years. My name is Bhaskar Vempati. I'm from I'm the current president for Indian Association of Sacramento. <coughs> I want to, we are celebrating a festival of lights around the globe this year, uh, today actually, in fact. So I brought some sweets and candies to, and the clay lamps yeah. and the Diwali literature to you all. So regarding Indian Association of Sacramento is a non-profit organization based out of Greater Sacramento and is an umbrella organization of 15 plus Indian regional organizations. Indian Association showcases a cultural diversity of India to the local community and the second and third generations of Indians. IAS organizes like a large event on India Day on August, around August 15th with over 5,000 people to showcase Indian diverse culture to the local community. <coughs> IAS not only a 
cultural organization, but also a non-charitable organization. It supported over $200,000 to the local community. More recently, we supported Sutter Middle School with supplies in the Sacramento School. And also, we supported several shelters last year when the, there, is a, there was a COVID wave here. IIS also participates in several community events, including MLK, Veterans Day, and also organizes and involves in uh, women empowerment and youth development activities. So regarding Diwali, Diwali is known as a festival of lights. It's uh, celebrated over the globe by the Hindu diaspora. The word Diwali comes from the, it means the row of lights. The festivities include the elimination of lights, candles, firecrackers, and the diyas to symbolize the victory of good over evil, inner light over spiritual darkness, and knowledge over ignorance. Diwali is a time for gathering with the loved ones, celebrating life, and committing to making the right decisions in life. Once again, thanks to you all. We appreciate all your support to the several Indian initiatives for the past four years. Thanks to you all once again. Happy Diwali. Happy to. Thank you, Bodhi. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, next is uh, Bhaskar Kimpa. Oh, yeah. Oh, that was so, Bhaskar. So we did the both. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Ria? <clears throat> Good evening, my name is Rhea Shavastov and I'm a junior at Vista Lago High School and an organizer with NFFCUSD. I wanna start by recognizing the important equity achievements the district has made over the past few months. Hiring a social, emotional and equity leader for the district, Dr. Pease has allowed students the ability to express their experiences to an individual who has consistently shown up for them and advocated for their needs. Many schools are also implementing implicit bias training for teachers, allowing for a more culturally responsive staff. Some schools are experimenting with peer-to-peer -peer conflict mitigation strategies, and others are looking into restorative justice trainings in order to reduce punitive actions. Additionally, myself and a few other students and community members have been able to participate in the School Safety Steering Committee in order to discuss the needs of students and how to best support their safety. I'd like to point out the barriers that stand between students and expressing our voices within the district. It is difficult as a student to feel safe expressing our opinions to positions of authority. The FCUSD student experience is not monolithic. We come from diverse backgrounds and represent different populations, and it is essential that decisions are made with the consideration of every student. Many students have jobs, family responsibilities, language barriers, trauma, and more that prevent them from being able to attend school board or committee meetings to express their needs. And it is often these same students who are most heavily impacted by decisions made by the board. As such, it is essential that the district reaches out to them and validates their concerns and then takes action to fix these problems problems. Especially when students face issues of discrimination such as racism or homophobia, there should be a safe space for them to discuss their experience. They should be involved in the process of repairing the harm caused to them and the district should stay accountable to their stakeholders to work actively against discrimination as it occurs on almost a daily basis. Furthermore, increasing diversity amongst the SUSD teaching staff will allow students to relate to their educators. Research has shown that students produce better outcomes when they are being taught by teachers that look like them. There has also been a high volume in incidents within the district in which teacher, students have been discriminated against by their teachers. Hiring more diverse teachers will increase cultural sensitivity within the teaching staff. As a reminder, the school to prison pipeline is rampant within the district. Black students are 25 times more likely to be arrested on an FCUSD campus than their white peers. Each day, SROs patrol FCUSD campuses despite the trauma and fear that they inflict on students of color. There have been dozens of accounts of FCUSD students being threatened by the police off in the campus SRO. Statistically, punitive actions such as suspensions, expulsions, and arrests increase the likelihood of a young person being incarcerated in their adulthood. As such, the district should rely on restorative justice practice, practices which foster a student's growth and learning from their infractions. Peer-to-peer -peer conflict mitigation in which students serve as a third party in resolving conflict, conflicts among their peers has shown to improve conflict resolution skills, communication skills, and overall community feel on campus. For example, the Green Beret program in the Center Joint Unified School District has equipped elementary schoolers with such skills and re has reduced punitive actions. Overall, working towards equity, specifically anti-racism within the district, should be one of the utmost priorities to best serve FCUSD stakeholders. Thank you. Thank you. I think that's the end of our uh, <clears throat> public comment. I do need to read the broadcast statement, so I'll do that now. Uh, it's a little lengthy, so bear with me. A, a broadcast or recording is being made at the direction of the board, and the broadcast may capture images and sounds of those attending the meeting. <clears throat> the meeting is being live streamed on the district's YouTube channel. The public health and well-being are the top priority of the Board of Trustees, Folsom Cordova Unified School District. 
and you are urged to take all appropriate health and safety precautions. Falls Cordova Unified School District Board Policy 1313 promotes mutual respect, civility, orderly conduct among employees, parents, and the public. We will treat staff, parents, and members of the public with respect and expect the same in return. If any member of the public uses obscenities or communicates in a demanding, loud, insulting, or demeaning manner, the board will calmly and politely admonish the person to communicate civilly. Written comments were accepted <coughs> at, sorry, until 3 p.m. today. These comments were emailed to the board prior to the board meeting for review and will not be read out loud during the meeting. At the direction of the board, superintendent will do roll call, acknowledge the board received the electronic comments submitted by 3 p.m. Superintendent? Mr. Short? <coughs> yes. Mr. Reed? Aye. Mr. Hoover? Aye. Mr. Clark? Aye. Mr. Huey? Aye. Ms. Gao? Aye. All are accounted for. Thank you. Thank you. Um, statement on face coverings, uh, as you see, we're all wearing them. As a reminder, in addition to the state health order and corresponding face covering guidance, the Sacramento County Department of Health and local order issued on July 29th remains in place, requiring face coverings in all indoor public settings and workplaces, including school settings. Copies of the county's health order are available for anyone who wishes to review during this meeting. Falls Cordova Unified School District requires all in-person attendees at the school board meetings to wear face coverings regardless of vaccine status. For those who do not have a mask, one will be provided for you. <clears throat> and in accordance with the advice of the legal counsel for the district, the most current orders by the California Department of Public Health and the County of Sacramento Health Officer, please be advised that the board is legally required to ensure that all attendees, regardless of vaccination status, except individuals who are specifically exempted pursuant to the CDPH mandate, wear face coverings while attending the meeting in person. The only exemptions are as follows. A person younger than two years old, persons with a medical condition, mental health condition, or disability that prevents wearing a mask, persons who are hearing impaired or communicating with a person who is hearing impaired where the ability to see the mouth is essentially for communication. Persons unable to wear a face covering based on medical or mental health exemptions may be subject to the request for verification. In addition, persons exempted from wearing a face mask due to medical or mental conditions must wear a non-restrictive alternative such as a face shield with a drape on the bottom edge or as long as their condition permits it. The district does allow members of the public to attend the board meetings in a virtual format, which is described on the district's website at FalsalCordovaUnifyschoolDistrict.org. With that said, we'll move on to our meeting. Uh, Okay, that was our public. Moving on to item eight, reports of district organizations. We'll start with Student Advisory Board. Um, SAB hasn't met since our last district meeting, uh, so I have no update other than to say uh, that our next meeting will be Wednesday, November 10th at 10 a.m. Thank you. Uh, California School Employee Association. Good evening, school board members and Dr. Kaligian. <clears throat> um, including student input, input in our school safety committee recommendations is essential. Um, it's important to understand their perspective and concerns. I, I'm very impressed with the, with the passion that uh, our students have and, and how um, they're, they're really striving to make things a, a better environment on campus. Um, um, also essential is including the input of classified employees. And with that said, I have the final results for uh, the CSEA School Resource Officer Survey. Um, and uh, regarding patrolling around campus and, and uh, being on campus, 92% of classified employees feel much safer or somewhat safer having SROs um, providing that service. Um, only 8% feel no safer or less safe. Um, regarding how many SROs, 50% uh, want to go back to six. 34% would uh, say that uh, 4 or four SROs is sufficient. And 16% say fewer or no SROs. Um, so um, that is, uh, that's the bottom line is your classified employees really feel that SROs are an important part 
of, uh, of our overall school safety program. Thank you. Thank you. Moving on to Folsom Cordova Education Association. Good evening, board members and Dr. Kaligian. Um, so recently I visited some of our alternative education sites, and I have to say how proud I am about the options that FCUSD offers. We have a wide variety of programs to address the needs of all our students and provide them with the best possible environment for their individual learning. So I'm just going to highlight a couple of those. Um, at Walnut Wood, they have the Adolescent Preschool Program, or Ad Adolescent Parent Preschool Program, allowing our young parents to continue their education while knowing that their child is being cared for in a safe space. There are also many life skills incorporated in the program to help them succeed after graduation. Our adult ed school supports the whole family. It provides the student access to employment opportunities and has a wealth of resources to empower families. Classes range from basic skills to career pathways, and they include instructional assistants that can then come back and work in our schools with our own students. Um, lastly, the Innovations Academy is continually looking forward. I know I spoke about them at a previous board meeting. Expanding their secondary offerings will make an even richer virtual program for our students. We know that virtual learning is here to stay, and with um, Mrs. Walker's vision, she's just going to keep building that program and making it a better place for our students to learn. I just want to end saying that it's a pleasure to work with all of our dedicated and resourceful staff, from teachers to admin to classified support employees. Everybody puts our students' needs first, and they're always looking for the, be for the best ways to evolve and meet our students where they are and carry them forward. Thank you. Thank you very much. Folsom Cordova Leadership Association. Good evening, Dr. Kaligian, President Short, board members, and cabinet. It's great to see everybody in person. I'm representing FCLA today, and I am most honored to highlight all the great things happening at my school, Natoma Station Elementary. Um, and tonight's focus will be how we're using social emotional learning as a bridge to educational equity. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce my amazing team. We'll start with Courtney Morales. She's our culture and climate facilitator. Um, Miss Christina Cameron, she is also our culture and climate facilitator. Bryn Hermsmeyer, who led us in the pledge earlier. She's our student council president. Uh, Mark Dionisio, he's our student council recording secretary. Grace Stuckart, our student council corresponding secretary. Um, and we have two new students to Natoma Station, Naya Bell, she's a fourth grader, and Abigail Webster, she is a fifth grader and on our leadership team. Okay. Okay. So um, today we're going to focus, as I said, on social emotional learning and how we're using that as a bridge to educational equity. And this year we're really focusing on building strong and positive relationships with all our stakeholders where everyone feels connected and a strong sense of belonging. So what we know, students are returning this year from non-traditional schooling and where most experience some form of isolation and disconnection due to the effects of the pandemic. So how we chose to respond as a school site is we are intentional about building social emotional skills at school by integrating SEL in everything we do. So tonight we're gonna focus on responsive classroom, monthly character trait focus, PBIS, positive behavior interventions and supports, and our second step social emotional curriculum. And I will pass it on to Christina Cameron. She will talk about Responsive Classroom. Hi there. So Responsive Classroom, we were fortunate as a site to partner this summer with um, Empire Oaks Elementary, White Rock, and Theater Judah. And some of our staff were fortunate to attend a four-day training this summer. Um, and we got to be trained in Responsive Classroom and take that back to our site and help train our colleagues where we've been implementing a few things this year with Fidelity. So Responsive Classroom, what is it? Um, it's an approach, it's not a program. So what they say in Responsive Classroom is it's not one thing extra on our plate, it is the plate. 
Um, so it embraces engaging academics, it builds a positive community, um, it lends its hand to effective classroom ma management, and it's just developmentally responsive teaching. It's just good teaching. So when you come visit us, you might see a few things at our sites, um, and this is what responsive classroom might look like and sound like. Um, we have morning meetings, we have energizers, um, we have a quiet time. So every site or every teacher at our site is implementing a quiet time right after recess or at lunchtime, sorry. And it's really helpful for our students because when they come back, they need that extra few minutes to kind of rest, reset, refocus, maybe have a little side conversation with the teacher about an incident that might've happened at lunchtime. And instead of trying to come in and jump back into teaching right away, it gives some kids a chance to quietly work, quietly focus, and lets us kind of make a connection and solve any problems that we need to solve. Um, so that's our quiet time. Closing circles, we have a consistent quiet signal ac across our campus. So if you come in, you might notice if you're walking through rooms, our teachers will hold up our zero noise sign to get everybody's attention. Um, we use positive teacher language um, and all of that lends to student engagement. So I'm gonna invite Mark over to tell you more about morning meetings because he's much more exciting than I am. Okay. Um. Hi, um, I'm Mark Denisio, and I'm the Student Council Recording Secretary. Morning meetings help start my day off right. I love learning new things about my classmates. For example, I learn more languages that people speak during the greetings, such as Japanese, German, Tagalog, Ukrainian, Spanish, and Arabic. Another thing I love is the activities. A warm and blows is a fun activity where everyone moves their chair into a circle. And one person goes in the middle and says, a warm wind blows for anyone who likes popcorn. Then everyone who does like popcorn would go, would go to a chair and only one person should be standing. Then that person would go to the middle and be the next warm wind blows. Those were some of the few things that make my day better in the morning meetings. Thank you. Um, this is just a quote from one of our colleagues at Natoma Station, and she says that responsive classroom has created a classroom community that feels like family. My first graders have learned each other's names, interests, and likes and dislikes within a matter of weeks. When there is a conflict, they treat each other with the respect and empathy, which is huge. We love the responsive classroom approach. Hi, my name is Brandon. I'm student council president. Each month, we work on character traits. For example, last month in October, we focused on the character trait self-control. We also have monthly challenges connecting to character traits. You can enter a video, a drawing, or writing. The raffle winner gets to pick out a certain character trait book from our virtual library ran by Ms. Hom. The virtual library is very useful to students. It allows them to read or listen to a read aloud online if they hadn't gone to the library yet. When one or two students from each class gets picked, the next week, they go to the garden with the principal and have lunch. Students love going to lunch with the principal. Thank you. And just a little bit more on the character traits. And this, we were inspired by other sites that also do something similar. Um, and I know Empire Oaks does something similar. So just a few things. It does align with our responsive classroom um, approach. Uh, many times during that morning meeting time, if the focus is on self-control, teachers will lead a discussion about what does it mean, what does it look like to have self-control. Um, and uh, it also aligns with our second step SEL curriculum. So for example, unit two is on emotion management, which also aligned very well with our focus on self-control last month. Um, so um, do you wanna, yeah, thanks. We also have staff weekly read readings, read alouds that are reco recorded and shared. And then the read alouds align with our monthly theme. Again, this is borrowed from an idea. I know Theater Judah does something similar and Ms. Perrinzen, I know she does a principal read aloud. So we open this up to all our staff and it's available to our community as well. We share it every week in our Cheetah Bites newsletter that goes out every Friday for families to explore. And of course it's open to our students. And then if you wanna hit the other, so this is just what our monthly challenge for this month's month looks like. So our focus is gratitude for November. 
And I think Bryn did an excellent job explaining what it is. And there is a monthly drawing. Students can choose a book. And if you just scroll down a bit, Rochelle, um, our virtual library is shown there. And then this is um, our curated collection of books that we're really focusing on uh, equity, educational equity, and ma we're making sure that there's um, representation in our books. Um, and once uh, for the winner, they get to choose one of the books and that's their raffle prize. So we're also, of course, um, embracing and encouraging literacy at the same time. And I think if we go to the next link, so this is Mitron, he's a second grader. He's actually in Mrs. Cameron's class and he submitted a video entry for our responsibility challenge. So I'll let him kind of explain what responsibility means to him. Hi everyone, I'm Mitran. I'm a second grader at Natamastes Elementary School. Today I'm gonna tell you about how I was responsible. Two weeks back, I had my coffin cold I was responsible by staying in the home. Even though the symptoms were mild and I tested negative for COVID, I wanted to stay at home and visit school only after my symptoms were gone. I did my part by being responsible for the society. Everyone must do their part by being responsible so we win this fight together. <laughs> So that's just one example. And of course, students have the option to do, send in a drawing or a written. And we do highlight that and share it again out with our community in our Cheetah Bites newsletter. Um, and then of course, the students get to enjoy and I get to enjoy and uh, meet with them in a smaller setting in our garden and enjoy lunch together. All right. So through our positive behavior interventions support approach, our culture and climate team has created three behavior standards that set clear expectations in our different key locations on our campus. We have created signs that set expectations that are strategically posted throughout our campus, which allow for positive reminding and reinforcement of those expectations. Another approach that our school has implemented to support social emotional learning of our students is restorative practices. Our team has created student support binders for our teachers and staff, support staff, which include resources regarding our student support logs. Additional resources were added to support the social, so, social and emotional needs of our students, such as student reflection sheets, which allow our students to reflect and reset. Our student support logs are used to collect data, which are then inputted into our Swiss database. This allows our culture and climate team to collect, summarize, and use behavior data to goal set and to make informed decisions about our school site. Our team and staff's training and implementation of restorative practices focuses on encouraging and modeling for students how to repair harm through restorative circles, reflection sheets, and our playground, ba playground banners, as you've seen on the slide. Additional supports at Natoma Station include our special friends program, our exploratory space, and our rest and reset. And now I'd like to introduce one of our NSE students, Grace, and one of my former students. She will be sharing more about our behavior standards and our cheetah champs. Thank you. Hi, my name is Grace Stucker, and I am the uh, student council corresponding secretary. Our three behavior standards are show respect, make good decisions and solve problems. When we show the three behavior standards, we get cheetah champs from yard supervisors or teachers. Each class has a basket to put our cheetah champs in. Every Friday, every teacher pulls one or two cheetah champs and our names are announced on the last speaker. Okay, so all these things that we're doing, how do we measure the impact and how do we know that it matters? So I'd like to invite Abigail um, and Naya up here to give you some student testimony. Abigail is a fifth grader and is also on our fifth grade leadership team and Naya is in fourth grade. So girls, come on up. Hello, my name is Abigail. 
I have been to two schools before, but I think Natoma Station is my favorite. I have met many kind people, made a lot of friends. Natoma Station is so welcoming. All of my teachers are the coolest teachers ever. The library is amazing and has so many books to read. The librarian is very helpful and has the perfect book suggestions. During recess, the yard duties are always keeping us safe and the, play, the new playground has so much to explore. I especially like climbing on the big spiderweb structure. I love making new friends, meeting new people, and definitely learning new things. I love being an Atoma Station cheetah. Hi, my name is Naya Bell. My first, my first day at Natoma Station was August 11th. I feel like I belong here. The yard supervisors and staff make sure all of the kids are treated fairly. My teachers really care about my education. If I need help on a math quick check, Miss Morales helps me by explaining every question. Miss Volheim helps me with math and reading. I have gotten better with her help. I love being a student at Natoma Station because it is the best. There's not a whole lot more to say than that, right? So, but because we always need data and numbers, we do have SEL surveys. We started Panorama this year. Our K through fifth students are gonna take that three times this year. Um, we have the um, a surveys for staff through administrator and healthy, healthy kids survey. And we also have the healthy kids survey for our fifth graders and for our families. Um, and then again, like Ms. Morales mentioned, we have our student support binder where we look for trends and we try to figure out when our issues happening so we can address those issues and solve those problems. And then just a little bit on sustainability. So this year we have the digital platform for the second step and we're implementing that and our two coaches here have been extremely supportive of our teachers. Um, we also partner with families. We had an SEL parent workshop in October. It was very well received. We shared what SEL is, how we do it at Natoma Station, and we also shared strategies that parents can use at home. Um, we also, as you can see, we like to partner with our students and ensure that they have a voice. Um, student council and the fifth grade leadership team, they create videos um, reviewing what our expectations are. So we made a video about you know, how to be in the multi, how to get through the line, how to get your lunch, et cetera. Um, also this year, we are building an exploratory space and again, the inspiration um, from, for this came from both Williamson and from Empire Oaks. I know they have an alternative recess space. We kind of broadened the, and we made it more of a multi-purpose space. So we've added some STEAM activities. Um, we have a Lego wall that we're planning. Um, and we also have a rest and reset corner for students that need to take a break and kind of just regulate themselves. And we also have rest and reset spaces set aside for classrooms and shared spaces like pods. Um, and of course, our continued collaboration with FCUSD school leaders, um, our climate and culture facilitators to monitor our progress, reflect and continually improve. The Thomas Station is a welcoming campus where everyone feels a strong sense of belonging and is encouraged to use their voice to create a community where diversity, inclusion, and equity are practiced and celebrated. And then finally, just, just a huge thank you to the FCUSD leadership team. We have an amazingly dedicated, caring, strong team, um, and we are continually growing our capacity as leaders and as uh, teachers, students, parents, our entire community. Also, I wanna thank the SEL department. They've done an excellent job bringing really relevant PD to us um, and also supporting us with certain students that we need a little additional support with. Um, also, I wanna um, acknowledge our two amazing climate and culture facilitators, Christina and Courtney. They do a lot for our school in terms of building the capacity of our staff and just really setting the positive tone um, when you come to visit our site, because I know you will, you have an open invitation, I think you'll really feel the positive culture and climate. That's a lot of the feedback we get from our visitors. Um, of course, our entire Natoma Station staff, it takes a village, um, and our families are part of that. And of course, most importantly, are our absolutely amazing students that make us proud every day. So, ready? 
Go Cheetahs! <laughs> Yeah, yeah, go ahead, Mr. Yeah, uh, Mr. President. Um, yeah. You know, it, it's every time we have a, a school come in and, and share what's going on, I, I get excited and I, I keep on coming to the same question, which is, do, I mean, this was a wonderful presentation, I, and I really enjoy what is is happening here at Natoma Station. And, and I, I often wonder, do we share these best practices um, throughout the district? Like, is there an opportunity for uh, Thomas Station to essentially teach all the other elementary schools that may or may not be engaging in this type of, of, of program, uh, the successes in their, um, you know, that they're, they're experiencing and other schools could share with, with um, like I think Mather uh, was in, uh, a couple meetings ago, and they had a wonderful program too. And, I, and you know, um, obviously we can't incorporate everything at every single school, but still, I think there's a, an opportunity to share these best practices um, within the community, uh, so that each school site could maybe pick and choose things that are really exciting that work would work well for their district. So I, I'm just kind of curious, how, how do we how do we go about that, uh, and are we doing it? I assume we're doing it to yeah. some degree. Well, it is our, our district focus and our SEL department, SEL and equity department, working alongside our site leadership and our culture and climate leaders and PBIS coaches um, have been integrating this into our curriculum. Um, there are resources available. Um, the, our SEL curriculum second step has served as a foundational piece and gives a lot of different strategies the responsive classroom training that we heard about is actually district wide and um, and schools are adapting it um, to, to work with their culture of their schools. And that's what we love to see as we visit classrooms, we're seeing those morning meetings, we're seeing the energizers, we're seeing students participate. And I'm so thankful that our students shared what it means to them because as an educator myself and a parent and a grandparent, I think, oh my goodness, this is absolutely a great day to, great way to start your day and also end your day. So it's, it's being infused. And as one of our leaders, our culture leaders said, it's not another thing on the plate, it's the plate. I love that phrase. Thank you. Yeah, the one thing I, I would, I just, is a way to go back to slide six here. Uh, something, yeah, uh, that one. Uh, <laughs> I know this is going to sound hokey, but um, this that that that's um, how to apologize banner. Uh, you know, I was reading that over, and I'm like, you know, this is perfect. I mean, this is this is like something that we should have at every single school. <laughs> we, uh, uh, I mean, you know, this is something we should be teaching adults actually as well. Um, I mean, I was just reading that as they were making the presentation, and uh, you know, I guess I. Even me personally, I hadn't really thought about, you know, steps to go through to apologize, and um, and this is something that we all should be able to do. Um, I mean, we all make mistakes, and and we need to own those mistakes when we make them. And you know, I, I, sometimes I think, you know, folks, whether it's 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 younger kids or or adults, or people of any age. Uh, I think sometimes think people just don't know how don't know how to apologize. They they might want to apologize, but they don't know how to go about it. I, this is just wonderful. So, anyway, uh, I just wanted to comment on that. So, thank you, Mr. Clark. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Ms. Vicky, I I just want to commend you and your staff for the amazing work you do, especially with our students and especially your student government, you, you're not giving them enough credit. I'm gonna tell you that because in the years that I have visited that school, they're doing just more than working on this and, and doing those things. They're out in the community, they have community events. And I think we're missing the Veterans Day celebration this year, unfortunately, but every year that student government does something good and you're just setting the bar for our other student governments to just step up and do the same thing. So I applaud you and I don't think I've seen you this year, have I? You have an open invitation. Yeah, I so. uh, tell you what, Monday morning I will be there. We will be happy to have you. All right, look forward to it and I look forward to visiting some of the students' classes and, and talking to them. I understand that there is a fifth grader, fourth grader, Fourth. All right. Well, hopefully, 
I get to visit those classes and absolutely. hang out. Absolutely. All right. You can participate in a, in a morning meeting. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, ma'am. Any other? No? Oh, I just want to say the same thing and kind of, you know, echo what Mr. Clark said is wonderful for coming. Great presentation. And when I saw the same thing, what Mr. Reza, how to apologize, you know, us adults need to do a lot more, but I was raised that my father said, if you mess up, you fess up, and then you clean up. That's part of the integrity of apologizing. So a wonderful job. I'm really glad to see you out here. Hopefully we can see you soon too, okay? Okay, moving on to District English Learners. No, I'm sorry, Falls Cordova Leadership Association. That was, that was oh, I'm sorry. District English Learners, I got it right, sorry. Good evening, President Short, members of the board, Superintendent Dr. Kaligian, and my esteemed colleagues. I have a quick report tonight. Next Tuesday, uh, November 11th, we will have our next DLAC meeting, and I wanted to highlight a couple of things. Parents put together the agenda throughout the year, make requests based on needs assessment. And one of the things that our DLAC parents um, really want to grow um, their, their understanding about is all the many programs that we, we offer here in our district. Um, the, your questions, Mr. Reed, are super relevant, and those discussions continue throughout the year in the DLAC meetings. This coming Tuesday, the focus um, is going to bring on a couple of things. They're going to continue the discussions on the New Pacific Charter School. They raised a lot of questions regarding that, and they want to continue that. But the thing I want to highlight is that our adult ed program is bringing in some information, and, um, and it, they're really excited about it. And I just want to highlight a couple of those things. As we know, adult ed provides a lot of services to our community and our parents and our just community members in general. Um, of course, there's English as a second language classes. They, they also offer vocational English as a second language class, which our parents are excited about. With all the many jobs out there, some of the things that are the barrier for them is that language and that language related to that particular field they're working in. And so our adult ed offers that support. Our parents are looking forward to hearing about that. Also, they have the opportunity to complete high school diploma or take the high school equivalency as well as have the opportunity to study and prepare for the U.S. citizenship and integrated in educational and training programs throughout the community and local businesses. So just some things that we're looking forward to sharing with our parents and also some highlights on the refugee program and connecting them to not only ESL, but job opportunities and just connecting to the community at large. So that's my report. Looking forward to, um, you're always welcome to our DLAC meetings. They're, they're, it will be virtual at 4, four to 5.15. And so we'll share, if you cannot make it, we always share our information. And as a last note, we did have our summit last, um, this Tuesday of this week, and we're um, collecting all of the data and feedback that we received. And I'll re provide that report at the next meeting. Thank you so much. I, I do want to say that parrot summit was awesome. Thank you. And Thank I you. really enjoyed it. And the affinity groups was really good. I was really impressed with all the languages and all the interpreters that have been around for over decades. And it's just amazing the resource, what you've done and the staff and everybody's done. It's, I just want to say wonderful job. Thank you. We have a wonderful support team. Yes, they work was, really hard. It's amazing. I appreciate yeah. your, com your compliment. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, moving on to agenda consent, uh, item nine. I do I have a motion? Uh, Mr. Mr. President, uh, yes. Uh, I'd like to make the motion, but I'd like to pull item L for discussion. Okay, Mr. Reed's got a first pu or pulling item L, adoption resolution number 11-04-2114, approving purchase of sale agreement from Near Circle Property. Do I have a second? A second. Mr. Clark on a second. Uh, Superintendent Roll Call. Mr. Short. Yes. Mr. Reed. Aye. Mr. Hoover. Aye. Mr. Clark. Aye. Mr. Huey. Aye. Ms. Gow. Aye. Motion carries 5-0. Thank you. Great. Superintendent, can you introduce item L for yes. discussion? And item L is adopt resolution 110421, approving the purchase and sale agreement from our near circle property. And Mr. Washburn is happy to be bringing this back <laughs> with a, a, a final uh, purchase and sale agreement. Um, so we'll, he will entertain any questions that you may have, Mr. Reed. Yeah. Uh, Mr. President? Yes, go okay. ahead. Um, yeah, I just had a couple uh, quick questions, and, and I apologize in advance because I, I um, should have uh, 
uh, sent the email to uh, the staff so that they might be prepared. So it's okay if you don't have the answers. But all right. So the the first of all, I'm excited to see this uh, because you know uh, we we definitely need to. Um, get rid of our surplus property that we do not uh, plan on using. Um, so Fund 40, uh, where the 2.38, uh, 380, uh, $2.3 million is, is going. Um, how much money is in Fund 40 right now? Um, do we know? Is it, or can you give an <laughs> estimate of how much money is in there? Don't you have that memorized? Yeah. Is there any money in there? <laughs> Okay, um, I, I assume that's the fund where uh, the resources uh, or the, the funds from the Granite Center are, are going to as well, Fund 40? The, the sale of the Granite Center, the, the monthly payments that we're getting, yes. it, yeah, that's, that's going to Fund 40 also? Okay. Correct. Um, and so wh what do we use the Fund 40 for? In, um, how do we spend down Fund 40, and what are the purposes that we use those those funds for? So Fund 40 could be any capital facility projects, not um, specifically assigned. So you know, if we had to, one of the things we talked about was uh, special programs. Um, part of that will have to be the fund that it was, the money that it came from. So the sale of that site, if it was purchased out of Measure M, then eventually it would have to go back into Measure M at some point. We're putting it in the capital facilities funds for right now. And then we'll have to identify and work with special projects that may need funding that doesn't come out of a specific fund or specific bond fund or can't be funded out of developer fees, then that would be paid for out of, the, out of that. Um, I mean, we, we had looked in the past probably at a maybe an alternative education center or some certain things like that if, if there was a specific need for something like that. So something it has to be something of a, of a capital nature then? Yes, absolutely. It has to be capital facilities. You can't go back into general fund or anything like that. But I mean, hypothetically, um, if we need fencing at a certain site, we could use the money for, for that. Or if we need a, a portable to purchase a portable at a certain site, we could potentially use it for that. Is, is that correct? I don't know if I'm comfortable saying that without looking into that more. <laughs> okay. I mean, Sean and I would have to have more discussion about that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, as, as Matt shared, because the original purchase was used using bond proceeds, we're going to put that money back. But yeah. generally in Fund 40, you do have the flexibility. It's kind of a catch-all capital facility project account location. Um, but um, because we have so many SFIDs and unique situation in Folsom Cordova that I'm learning about, um, we do want to make sure that we monitor and track those funds so that they go back to the appropriate department or, or, or I guess, SFID area or community area, depending on where those funds were generated from. I'd be hesitant to use it for any kind of, not consider maintenance type projects, but I don't think that would be considered a capital facility type project. But obviously, like the funds from the Granite Center, uh, that predates all of those bond funds and everything else. So I assume that that's just money that. Yeah. Yes, and and so because that is a we're carrying that as a note. Um, we had an initial payment. Now we're paying, and then there's I forget the length of the term, and then there's a balloon payment at the end. So as those funds come in, they will be recognized in Fund 40 and be available for activities. Yes. And then when we uh, when we do utilize those funds for whatever reason we utilize it, does the does the board approve the use of those funds in the annual budget, or how how does that come to uh, the board, or, or does it come to the it board? It is recognized as an overall budget. We normally don't break down individual activities. If they're going out for a purchase, then we would be bringing those contracts to you for approval. And so depending on the funding source, it could be Fund 40 or any of the bond proceeds. You see those contracts coming through. Um, often they're on the consent agenda or when we're doing big projects, they'll, they'll actually be a discussion okay. item if it's like first. And the funding source will be attached to that to what it is funding okay. that specific project. Okay. All right, wonderful. Well, I'm excited to hear this. Uh, and maybe is there an update on the status of the sale of the old Folsom Lake uh, site? Yes, there is. We have uh, the uh, time period is expired extended or has been expired for anybody who to respond based on uh, public entities. We have received one offer. Um, we are working on the purchase and sale agreement with that and negotiating when the, on that specific one. We just had the appraisal. So we are working on fair market value and we are looking to bring that to the board in December. Excellent. Okay. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any other board questions? 
No? Oh, so I'll, I'll uh, motion uh, the, uh, the adoption of uh, item L. I, item L. Item L. Item L. Yeah, yeah. Item L. Yeah. I have a second. I'll repeat the second. You, you're good. Yeah. Okay, yes, so Mr. Clark on second. First on Mr. Reed on item L. Uh, roll call, please. Mr. Short? Yes. Mr. Reed? Aye. Mr. Hoover? Aye. Mr. Clark? Aye. Mr. Huey? Aye. Ms. Gow? Aye. Motion carries 5 0. Thank you. And I do have a quick update. It looks like uh, we ended, uh, or we're right currently, we have about an $8 million um, ending fund balance in Fund 40. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was good. You did that quick. Yeah. Thought you should no, have it on top quick. of your head. You. But <laughs> next time you should just memorize it. <laughs> Ms. Mr. President, Mr. President, may I also yes. um, introduce uh, one of our new managers that was part of the consent agenda when the board approved the personnel action form? We have Ms. Katrina Glover, our new fiscal support manager, joining us tonight. And, and she is a face that we know very well and, and appreciate so much. For the last four years, Ms. Glover has served as the fiscal analyst for our district, assisting the director and fiscal support manager with the district's daily financial operations. Ms. Glover began her tenure in Folsom Cordova 14 years ago and has been an integral component of the fiscal services department, serving in both the accounts payable and budget departments. And we are so excited that she is in this role and working side by side with Ms. Thurlow and with Mr. Martin and the whole team in our finance department. So congratulations, Katrina, and we're glad that you're in this position. Welcome aboard. Welcome on board. Thank you. Okay, moving on to item 10, public hearing. Item A, public hearing, intent to grant an easement to the Sacramento Municipal Utility District at Blanche Sprints Elementary School. Superintendent? Yes, this public hearing tonight is in regards to Sacramento Municipal Utility District requent, requesting a grant of easement at Blanche Sprints in order to do their scope of work for the modernization project which includes a new driveway and rerouting some of their electrical um, uh, infrastructure. So with that, we can open the public. Okay. Room. Yeah. Uh, first we'll do board questions only. It's not a discussion item. So any board questions to the staff? Okay. Hearing none. Then at this point, we will start the open public hearing as of right now. Do we have anybody from the public that would like to speak on this matter? Do we have anybody uh, um, virtually? No, Mr. Short. Yeah, no? no? No. Okay. Hearing none, we are going to close this public hearing as of now. And with our hearing is completed. Thank you. Moving on to item 11, discussion action item, item A, adoption resolution number 11-04-21-12, grant an easement to Sacramento Municipal Utility District at the Blanche Sprints Elementary School. Superintendent. Following the public hearing that we just held, we would like the board to approve um, the grant of an easement for SMUD for Blanche Sprints Elementary. All right, any board questions? There again, any, any final public comments? Virtually hearing that? No, Mr. Short. Okay, any final? board comments mr yeah. president yes mr. i president. move to um, accept this recommended motion yes we have first by mr clark do we have a second i'll say a second uh roll call please mr short yes mr reed aye mr hoover aye mr clark aye mr Huey. aye miss gow aye motion carries 5-0 thank you thank you moving on to discussion action item item b approved contract with Care Solis, Superintendent. Yes, tonight we have before you a contract for Care Solis, which uh, would provide additional supports outside of our school for mental and social emotional well being, physical well being for our students and our staff. And it really becomes an extension to the um, staff that we have where Care Solis can. Um, uh, extend out to the external resources uh, to, to create those wraparound services for students. And I'm going to introduce Mr. Don Ogden, who will go ahead and, and share some of the highlights of Care Solis. Thank you, Dr. Kligian. 
Um, this is a really exciting opportunity for our district. Care Solus is a um, organization that provides services to school districts like ours. And what they do is they, uh, they help students and families access mental health services. Um, they do that by reducing the burden of uh, coordinating and accessing services or insurance for, uh, for our students or their families to receive um, mental health services. Uh, a real benefit of this group is that um, when we are asking um, them to provide services for our students, uh, part of the contract is they will provide the same services for our staff also, as well as the families of our students and the families of our staff. Okay. Any, the, um, any board questions? Well, I've got a couple of slides. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> a few minutes. Oh, there you go. You got it. Okay. okay. Um, Carisolis is, uh, is a proven entity. They have a track record. They're already working with over 400 school districts, over 3 million students, and uh, 12 million uh, staff and family members. Okay. Uh, one of the uh, highlights of this group is that it's a 24-7, 365 service. So if our students or staff are needing mental health services, they have access to someone um, 24 hours a day. Uh, also, this group provides over 200 languages uh, to support mm -hmm. families that are uh -huh. trying to, or students or staff that are trying to reach out for mental health services. Um, it's uh, It's... A very fascinating program. When the, when I was talking to the person who represents them, we said, "Well, how long does it take to call somebody and, and get someone on the phone?" And he did it in in the meeting. A person came up on the screen, and we were able to talk to them immediately. So I was really impressed by that. the The challenge that we have right now is sort of shown by these uh, these bubble slides. So the bubble slide on the left is really. Um, it shows the gaps that we have for our students or families uh, in accessing mental health care. Because what will happen is a student will see their school counselor or perhaps a mental health specialist um, and we'll do uh, six sessions with them. We're allowed to do six sessions with a student. But after the six sessions, then they need to transition into something that's provided uh, outside of our school district. And so our mental health service providers turn into a concierge working with a family and the student to try and uh, link them with services outside of our, our school system and also help them navigate the insurance uh, you know, options that would help pay for these services. And um, what we're looking at with uh, Care Solis is they're actually going to step in and, and take that role. So that would allow our mental health workers to spend more time with students and providing mental health <laughs> services and, and actually you know, have a broader reach rather than spending that valuable time uh, trying to help people um, get services outside of our school. And I can tell you that um, Scott Meyer was bringing this up with the mental health uh, care providers and they're very, very excited about this. They think this is a great opportunity. Huh. Um, this also expands beyond just our students. Um, if you look at um, if you look at on the right, there's sort of a, a challenge if you are trying to get mental health services, because the first thing you need to do is you need to go through some kind of probably an online portal or something to look up whatever the services you need. Find someone in the area who provides those services, call them on the phone. You call them on the phone, and now you're trying to figure out okay, how do I pay for it? You know, what insurance do you take? Do you take my insurance? It, it's there's a real challenge there. Um, with Carisolis, they step in between. They've got the database. They understand the insurance or uh, how Medicare works with, uh, with different providers. So they're there being the intermediary uh, between our students, their families, and the service providers, as well as our staff, because our staff could access this too. Um, just to give you an idea of the workload of a mental health worker in our district, um, we have about 10 or 15 scheduled student contacts a day with our, our, our 20 uh, plus mental health workers. The other, the other uh, topic that people ask us is, okay, if you have a situation where you're a mental health worker in, in Folsom, Cordova, and you have a student that needs help, so you are going to do that work. You're going to reach out to the community and to the families, and you're going to help them link with someone outside of the school district that can provide those services. What, what does it take to do that? Well, this company, working with millions of people, has come up with a really amazing statistic. And Scott, I think your team would agree with this statistic. It's over 60 contacts 
for one person. And um, last year, I think our number was around between two and 300 stu uh, outreach situations were made. Uh, we had a year, I think two years ago before COVID, we had over 400 um, students that were linked uh, with outside service providers. And so if you think about that, you know, 450 um, incidents where one of our employees had to make 60 contacts, you know, 60 phone calls, emails, and texts. That's a lot of time, you know, our employees are investing in trying to make that connection. This group would come in and, and provide that service. They have, a, they have, I think, a really interesting goal for their company. And their goal is that they're gonna ensure uh, that students, families, and staff have reliable and ethical and high quality mental health services. And, and their time frame is quite amazing within one and 24 hours. So they have uh, you know, the acute urgent care providers and they also have perhaps long-term providers that they can refer people to. I think that's very helpful. To get this up and running in our district, it doesn't take a ton of training. Um, the first thing that they would do is a 25-minute strategic planning call with our leadership team. And um, we anticipate this, uh, if approved by the board, would take place between now and December so that we could be up and running in December. Um, they would then, uh, and part of that uh, strategic planning call would be to plan a 15-minute training with our district and school leadership. Uh, we would also plan 30-minute trainings with counselors, psychologists, mental health workers, therapists, nurses, and then uh, also our HR department, where we do refer people also, uh, employees currently to our, um, our EAP program. Uh, we would have a training with uh, HR and probably with Carrie Kay's office. The other uh, interesting you know, concept that when someone does this basically for a living, they understand that there's more to it than just having it in place. You have to have a communication plan almost like a marketing plan. Mm -hmm. So they would work very closely with our director of communications uh, and community engagement, um, Angela Griffin's office, to make sure that our staff and families on an ongoing basis had messaging, letting them know that this service was being provided uh, to students. So it wouldn't just be our mental health workers uh, that would be messaging this. It would be to, um, it'd be to our benefit to have our, our communications department helping with that. Uh, I have a slide here, and this was not created by the, by, um, by them, this was created by me. I wanted to share with, uh, with the board, this is, what, this is the program that we currently have okay. uh, for our, our staff. It's called an Employee Assistant Program. It's called EAP. However, this is quite different than what we're proposing here. There's some little overlap, but not, not a lot. The EAP program, it's a short-term program. So if an employee has, needs marriage counseling or has um, uh, alcohol or alcohol issues or financial issues, our EAP program will help them. But, the, but some of these issues are non-medical issues. And so your health insurance would not cover this. EAP does. It would be seven sessions that are paid for by the, our EAP program. So I'm not uh, suggesting that when we bring this new program on board that this goes away. I think this needs to remain because there's, there's still services here that, uh, that would not be provided by, uh, by Care Solis. Because this, uh, like I said, it's short term, it's non-medical, and uh, they don't provide uh, medical referrals either. So where Care Solis is one of their core competencies is, is making that connection between the, the person that needs care and the person that provides care, that actually doesn't happen with our EAP program. They wouldn't do that for, for medical issues. Um, the, the, uh, an interesting thing I looked up, because I, when I was doing this, uh, putting this together and wanting to share this with the board, one of the things I thought the board might ask me is, well, how often do our employees use EAP? We have you know, over 2,000 employees. Uh, last year, we, we had uh, sort of an overlap the way they, they added up, but it was about 166, 165 employees engaged with our EAP program. Now, through HR, we make referrals. There are situations that occur where we realize, you know, employee needs some help, and we have a brochure and an email that we send out uh, to, to our employees to encourage them to, to take advantage of our EAP program. Um, only 16% of the people that took advantage of it were referred by HR. Mm. And that, that really was an aha to me, because if, if that small percent, uh, you know, it's 85, about 85% are, are accessing it 
on their own or through other referrals uh, that made me realize all the referrals that we have for students it, you know that that need mental health maybe we are very very low on how many students actually should be out uh, being supported or how many staff members should be out being supported because right now uh, as HR looking at it we, we see a, a much smaller picture than what the need really is out there um, EAP also does some things just to show you the difference um, I wanted to share here's some of the things that that EAP uh, provides through our school insurance authority um, if you look at these these are like you know they have a leadership Academy they talk about uh, you know how to how to not spend too much money more of a financial you know uh, tilt to it not really a mental health tilt dealing with difficult people that's really relationship skills um, and these are all things that any of our staff can sign up and go to they have a leadership Academy uh, one talking about you know a work-life balance so I think these are all healthy things and would lead to mental health but these aren't you know people with acute mental health issues would not would not engage here they would need more help and that's really where care solace I think steps in so that was a brief uh, overview, but hopefully it was real helpful. This is a, the gentleman who reps, represents them. His name's Brett Gallagher. Um, I have interacted with Brett uh, a couple of times in the past. He actually worked with another company that, um, that provided services to school districts. He's very reputable. Uh, his wife is a mental health uh, care person. And uh, when he came and shared this with us, I, I felt you know he was a really good ambassador for this organization. And I think they would be very helpful for our district. I'd recommend that uh, the board approve this contract. Uh, the contract is for five years. It's a $309,000 contract. Um, if we equate that to what the cost is, it's really key that students, even though staff and students' families are, have access to it, because it's keyed towards students, that's how they, uh, they, they determine how much the cost is going to be. So to, to, put the, to map out the cost, it's $3 per student, every student in the district, per year for five years. So that's where the, um, mm. the number comes up. And so we also, you know, even though that drives the cost, we still are able to add all of our students' families, all of our staff members, and our staff members' families at no additional cost. Very good. Mm. Any board questions to staff? Uh, yes, Don. Uh, uh, Mr. Mr. Clark, President, Mr. I'm sorry. Uh, just for clarification, so we're going to be using um, understanding ESSER funds? Yes. So we're, we're locked in for five years. Uh, what if we want to expand that? I mean, where is the money going to come from? Uh, yeah, we will have to have a transition plan if we want to continue that program, but that's the <coughs> full length of time that we can sign a contract for, so it's the five-year term. So okay. we're kind of using those one-time funds to get sure. an ongoing benefit for us. And then uh, uh, similar with all the activities that we've been using COVID dollars, if we see benefit that is something we want to continue on, then we need to figure out a transition plan and mm. get it into the general fund or find some categorical resource that could help provide that cost. So. Okay, and then EAP still is still around. He's still and, going. Okay, because I, I think that's beneficial. I, I will share with you that I'm probably one of the 165 oh. uh, people who use EAP because at a certain time of the year, I have a hard time dealing with the loss of a loved one. So. Um, I think it's very important that we we keep that around. Yeah, I mean, I'm 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 good with this, Mr. President. I think it's a I think it's a good program. I'm just concerned about what happens after five years. That's a good question. Yeah. Okay, Mr. Hui. Just a couple of questions. Uh, if I if I heard you, Mr. Ogden, that's some we would expect somewhere around 450 outside referrals that are made. Pre-COVID, that was the, there was two years ago, it was over 400. We're, during the COVID two, you know, broken up years, I don't know that that data is as reliable. Uh, it was three, it was 200 plus one year, 300 plus the other. Yeah, give, so, or, take. Yeah, give um, or take. And I'm curious, I, I don't know if there is necessarily an answer for this, Mr. Meyer, maybe you know as well. Of, of those 450, give or take, are most of those referrals made um, for students that have Medi-Cal or is that... Is that a collection of private insurance and Medi-Cal? Any idea? Scott, do you know that? I, I don't know the answer, but Scott might. It would be a collection. Be a collection. Okay. Be a collection. Thanks. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mr. Reed. Yeah, uh, just a quick question. I, I might have misunderstood you. Did you say that um, we can only enter into a contract for five years? They would give us other options. This is the, the contract we're 
we're proposing is five years. It was the, we felt the, the best deal. Isn't it actually six years? Well, it's... Yeah. It, it's going through December uh, 31st, uh, 2027. That's a, that's a six-year contract. No, no, the contract actually doesn't start until January 1st. Of 2022. That's still a that's still a, Yeah, uh, but that still extends contract. until... No, I believe the contract only goes through 2027, so that would be a five-year contract. Yeah, but December. December. All of 2022, all of 2023, all of 2024, all of 2025, all of 2026, oh. all of 2027. <laughs> that's a six-year contract. Yeah. So you just save us a fifth of the price. Yeah. So, yeah I, I think we'll have to take a look at that. I think that was probably an error on the title. <laughs> Two dollars and 20 cents. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that, that was the only thing. I'm like, I, I pulled up, and I'm like, that doesn't seem to be, yeah, jiving. Okay. All right. I think that's a type of Okay, thank oh, you. Okay. Uh, yeah. Any other board questions? Uh, none? Can I hear none? Okay. I, I just, um, the only question I thought, would this dovetail to like a well, wellness center in the future? If we're, you know? Well, this this is an organization that's separate from Just us. separate from that, okay. And they have their own, uh, you know, when I when I was able to speak the the agent on the phone, uh -huh. the, I can't remember, they have a term for them, um, like a warm, they have a, a term, a warm something. And um, so it seemed like she was working out of an office. So uh -huh. they have offices where they do their work. They wouldn't come work out of one of our offices if we had a wellness center. It could be a toolkit maybe for a wellness center too, I guess, right? Yeah. Okay. For them to use to refer to. Yeah, people. okay. All right. Uh, okay, let's bring it out to the public. Any questions or comments to the public? Hearing none, how about virtually? No, Mr. Short. Okay, bring it back to the board for any final comments. Mr. Just, Uy, yes. Yeah, if I can make one last comment. I um, Thank you for bringing this to us. I'm really excited for it. Um, the school that I work at is in a different district that has Carousel as, as a program. Um, and I could tell you even just this year, I've I made an outside referral through Access, which is where you make uh, mental health referrals for students on Medi-Cal. Um, and about three weeks went by without the family hearing anything. A social worker from the school went to Carousel, gave them the student's name, and within the day they were called. Uh, so I think especially those students, as Mr. Roggins, you were mentioning that do have crisis going on, three weeks is too long. Um, and so, uh, you know, I mean, the, the well worth the price, I think, to make sure that we're getting our families connected with care. Um, and I, I think what a benefit to our employees as well that get to do that same thing. So um, thanks for bringing this before us. Okay. Any other board comments? Mr. Clark? No. I oh, you wish. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's uh, our final comments. Do we have a, do I have a motion? I'll move it. Ms. Clark first, a second. I'll second. And just for clarification, we're approving it with the understanding that the the, the year might be adjusted by one, correct? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay, we have a first and a second. Uh, roll call, please. Mr. Short? Yes. Mr. Reed? Aye. Mr. Hoover? Aye. Mr. Clark? Aye. Mr. Huey? Aye. Ms. Gao? Aye. Motion carries 5 0. Thank you. Thank you. Well done. Uh, Item 12, discussion only. Item A, measure G Citizen Bond Oversight Committee 2019-2020 annual report presentation, Superintendent. Yes, each year, um, Mr. Washburn brings forward the Bond Oversight Committee annual reports, which include the audits as well. And I wanna first thank our Bond Oversight Committee members for Measure G for their time in attending the meetings. And uh, Mr. Washburn will give a, a brief overview of some of the highlights from the Bond Oversight Committee. Thank you and good evening. As you recall, Measure G is the $195 million bond that was passed in 2014 for facility improvements for schools in uh, Folsom. Um, as part of the uh, Measure G and part of the annual report presentation, the Independent Oversight Committee bylaws has certain tasks that they need to perform. Part of it is presenting the annual report Part is informing the public, the committee shall inform the public concerning um, the district's expenditure of the bond reports, which includes uh, a review of the performance audit and also review of expenditures so that the bond funds are expended for projects uh, as indicated in the bond scope and also that no bond proceeds were used for teacher administrative salaries and, and things like that. Um, included in the packet is the annual um, report, um, which gives an overview of the uh, activities of the year from the Measure G Oversight Committee. 
and then also it includes the annual report mailer that it is, had is for the voters to give uh, updates of all the projects, both completed, planned, future projects. Talks about the bond um, and uh, all the aspects of it and everything's included in that. That's a little update on that. And, and before I have any questions, I would like to invite uh, Laura Ruby, who is the chair of the Measure G Bond Oversight Committee, and she will present the annual report. Members of the Board of Trustees, citizens and administration of the district, ladies and gentlemen, as chair of the Citizens Bond Oversight Committee for the Folsom Cordova Unified School District, it's my privilege and pleasure to present on behalf of the full committee, our annual report. The Bond Oversight Committee exists to ensure that expenditures of the funds collected under the voter approved bond measure G are spent on the items and project voters approved at the time of their vote. The committee is dedicated to ensuring that the public trust is well kept and remains intact throughout the life of the bond. The Bond Oversight Committee is pleased to report the expenditures of the fiscal year 2019-2020 after a full audit by an outside agency are in compliance with all laws, regulations, and accounting. On behalf of the entire committee, thank you for this opportunity to serve our district and ensure that all is in full compliance with legal and ethical guidelines. Thank you, Laura. And with that, we'd entertain any questions if you have any questions. Any board questions? Um, yeah, just Mr. President, Mr. Clark, uh, just Clark. one. Um, I'm looking at the bond oversight committee um, and you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and three of those are vacant. Uh, is it like a challenge to get community members to sit on that oversight committee? Because it looks like it's a business organization, a community member at large and a parent guardian, um, district student active in a PTO. I mean, is it a challenge trying to fill that? It is very challenging. Uh, we've worked with um, communications and I'm gonna work with Angela some more on this. We've worked with Dan Thigpen in the past. We've put ads in the paper. We've asked community members to find people. Um, we have one member who might be able to switch to another category. It might free up an easier one to fill. Um, it's something that's very challenging. When a bond passes, everybody's excited, everybody wants to be involved. And then as projects <laughs> get done and things yeah. happen, everybody's like, okay, oh. well, things are, you know, then it kind of, wanes off a little bit. Um, we have a very, the people on it are very active and, you know, um, involved. Um, it's just hard getting some of those key positions. So we'll continue to do that. Um, COVID is, is hurt too as well. I mean, obviously we with, you know, being virtual, so maybe getting back um, into a normal environment hopefully will help that. I mean, we can start to getting some committee members back in there and fill some of those positions. And just out of curiosity, how often, I'm, I'm not saying it, how often does the uh, Oversight Committee meet? We usually meet about three times a year, four times a year. We met, I believe, three times last year. A lot of times we don't have a quorum. We'll, we'll do an informal meeting if we don't have a, uh, a quorum. Okay. Is it uncommon for a board member, I'm not suggesting, but is it <laughs> uncommon for a board member to be on there? The... They can't be on the committee. They can't be. No, okay. they, I, staff can't be on the committee. Okay. It has to be outside. You can't have any financial interest in it. Anybody can't have that. So, it, 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 I mean, they can come to the meeting. Obviously, it's well, open. Yeah, that's, open, that's but yeah, meant. you can't yeah. be on the committee now. Okay. All right. Yeah, I just wanted to ask that question. Yeah. Okay. That's okay. All I have. Miss Reed. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I love the annual report, um, and I assume. Uh, communications was was involved or, or maybe helped with that but it's a really nice brochure um, that the or information item and I you know I noticed you did one for measure M as well I'm just wondering how uh, do we plan on uh, sharing that wonderful information with the public because you know I, I think it's really important for the public to constantly know what their tax dollars are going to because it, it really is a learning opportunity because in the future I'm sure we're going to have to go out to the public again for future bonds. And it would be nice for people to be educated that, oh, this money that we did on the last bond went to A, B, and C. And, um, uh, and so in a way, we're, we're promoting uh, uh, you know, 
you know, the, 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 the use of bonds for, for, for certain purposes. So are, are we looking at doing like putting these on the website? Are we looking at a communication uh, that's, that's sent out like um, at the end of the week that uh, promotes uh, the, the Measure M uh, uh, annual reports? Um, and first of all, thank you for this. Is actually, I'll uh, uh, make sure my staff gets accolades. They actually did. Oh, they did. Yeah, we well, did I thought it was the communication. No, I mean, that's, that's impressive. I'm going to work with her on it, but <laughs> and, and, uh, give me some ideas how I can work closer with her out to get this information out. So, yeah. in the past, this report's always gone out in the uh, utility bills. Okay. And we've worked okay. with various agencies. That's become more challenging um, throughout time. It's not required actually to do that. So what we're going to do, we're, we, and we do post it, it's on our website. So what we're gonna do is post on our website and then try to promote it as being on the website. And maybe that's where we can work with Angela, you know, maybe communication going out that also, you know, the annual report, you know, update on all the activities and projects within these various uh, SFID areas and what they're doing. So I think we can probably do that. More people are, are used to doing that. You know how utility bills, you get stuff in there and, and toss it and a lot of people don't see that. But every year since we've started that they have gone out in utility bills and uh, every every taxpayer homes has received it. I think it's the first year we probably haven't done that and we'll try to promote it through the website and through other means. All right, awesome, thank you. Uh -huh. Okay, any other board question? With that, hearing none, they're going out to the community. Do we have any comment? Berkeley? No, Mr. Short. Okay, hearing none, bring it back to the board for final comments. Just a discussion item only. I don't have none. None, hearing none. Okay, we're moving on to item B, discussion item 10B, measurement, uh, measure M, Citizen Bond Oversight Committee, 2019-2000 annual report presentation, Superintendent. Well, we have a, a similar report for Measure M. And again, I want to thank Ms. Ruby and your, your involvement on our Bond Oversight Committee. Thank you so much. And to the other citizens that are serving on the committee. Mr. Washburn, you want to give us a summary of Measure M? So as you know, Measure M is the $750 million bond that, um, you know, that uh, was passed in 2007 and for the uh, growth area south of Highway 50. Uh, since there was no residents at the time, the oversight committee was made up of residents of various SFI or bond committees. Um, we have a committee now, but we are going to revise the bylaws. Uh, some of these are terming out and we're going to, now that we have people actually active down there, we're going to try to recruit people within that area and kind of redo this committee and the makeup of the committee to have more people who will represent the area as well as other people probably from the community. So that one will change its makeup We'll probably be bringing bylaws back to the board throughout this next year and, and change some of that. Um, same information, same as that, but I'd like to have Laura for the record also give the report for Measure M. <laughs> I'm not contagious. <laughs> it's just the after effects. Um, Members of the board of trustees, <laughs> citizens and administration of the district, ladies and gentlemen, as, a ch as chair of the citizen bond oversight committee for the foursome, oh, good golly. As chair of the citizens bond oversight committee for the Folsom Cordova Unified School District, mm -hmm. it is my privilege and pleasure to present on behalf of the full committee, our annual report. The bond oversight committee exists to ensure that expenditures of the funds collected under the voter approved bond measure M are spent on the items and projects voters approved at the time of their vote. The committee is dedicated to ensuring that the public trust is well kept and remains intact throughout the life of the bond. The bond oversight committee is pleased to report that the expenditures of the fiscal year 2019-2020 after a full audit by the outside agency are in compliance with all laws, regulations and accounting. On behalf of the entire committee, Thank you for this opportunity to serve our district and ensure that all is in full compliance with legal and ethical guidelines. Thank you, Laura. You can tell Laura's uh, doing double duty and she's been very good, very active throughout this whole bond in both of these. So we really appreciate everything she's done. So with that, if you have any other questions, that's our, our report. Okay. Board questions? I don't have any. Anything? Any public comment? Any virtual? <coughs> No, Mr. Short. Bring it back. Final bud. Uh, final comments then? No. Same thing. Okay. This is just only a discussion item. 
I want to thank each and one of you. Thank you, Matt. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, moving on to item 12, discussion item, item C, proposed 2022-2023 instructional calendar, Superintendent. Yes, this is the time of the year where we start planning the instructional calendar for the next school year. And Mr. Don Ogden has put together a couple of sample calendars following some parameters such as trying to finish our semesters before the winter break and also finishing the school year before the end of, um, uh, or by the beginning of June or before, by the end of May. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Mr. Ogden to talk through uh, the, the differences in calendar A and calendar B. Thank you, Dr. Kligian. Well, I'll start with draft A. Um, when we look at draft A, one of the things that we'll notice uh, for next year's calendar, ne this is next school year's calendar, um, is that we have holidays in December, <clears throat> excuse me, that fall on the 25th. So Christmas is on, the, is on a Sunday, and then also New Year's is on a Sunday. So it sort of throws off our weeks uh, when that happens, and it makes it a little bit more challenging to put these calendars together. Um, so calendar A, what we typically do in our district is we try and get school um, for students ended uh, in the month of May so that in June we can do summer school. And so we, we, that reflects uh, in, in draft A also. Um, sometimes when we look at this calendar, what we try and do is sort of a tradition in our district is in April we have a travel day after the five-day week. So we typically have that day, and you'll see that's reflected in this calendar. And then um, we have two weeks for the winter holiday, which is sort of challenged with the holidays actually being on the weekend. And uh, if you look at the draft A and draft A2, the difference is in draft A, <clears throat> excuse me, our, our, uh, our winter holiday starts after Christmas. It's actually um, starts on the 26th and then it goes into the first week of January. When you look at that, it looks a little challenging because it makes you scratch your head and say, well, you know, what, if, what about people who need to travel before Christmas? There's a bit of a challenge there. Why would you do that? Well, on the bottom of our calendar, it, it shows semester grading periods. And we typically break up our school year so that students don't have to take their final after winter break to uh, the first semester goes up into winter break. The second semester is after winter break. So with this calendar, um, if you look at the draft A, what you'll find with, the, um, with those dates is a rather balanced um, school year. You have 88 days and, um, and 93 days um, with, with this model. Uh, on draft A2, we moved the holiday forward. And so what you'll see there is a full week prior to um, Sunday, um, Christmas Day is off. And then the week after Christmas up until the first uh, is also off. And then students will return to school on January 2nd. Um, this calendar uh, is a little bit more balanced, or is, excuse me, is not as balanced. Um, you'll look, the first semester is uh, 83 days, and the second semester is 98 days. So there's a, there's a big discrepancy between the time that students would be uh, at, you know, have to do their, uh, their first semester of work versus a second semester work. And uh, talking to our high school principals, that is a big concern to have that big of a, of a difference. Um, the next calendar that I would like to share is uh, what we're calling draft B. On draft B, it looks a lot like um, draft A, but one of the things that we've done here, uh, which has been a, a, a something we've done in our district a few times, is to offer a professional development day in October. And when we did this, it, it throws off a little bit our, our start and end dates. But again, in draft B, what we're trying to do here is have a calendar that is balanced. And to balance the calendar, again, uh, the winter break would start after Christmas. Uh, you would have the 24th of Saturday, but Christmas day would be the following day on Sunday. Uh, does not pro provide a lot of travel time before Christmas. Um, it, it does reflect all of the other uh, aspects that we talked about on calendar A, which is to leave June free for summer school um, and also to provide that travel day uh, after the, um, the spring or the, um, the Easter holiday. 
draft B2 um, moves that winter holiday forward and also retains the professional development day in October. Um, if you look at the days here, you'll see that imbalance occurs in this one again, because what happens here is again, we have uh, many, many less days in the first semester than the second. We have 85 days in the first semester and we have 96 days uh, in the second semester. So these are, these are four different ways of looking at the calendar next year. And we thought um, as the management team, we would bring these forward to the board and, and the public uh, to get some comments and some thoughts on, on how we should put this calendar together with the constraints and challenges that it possesses. Okay. All right, we can bring it back to the board for questions. Mr. President. Get you to read. Yeah, um, Mr. Ogden, I was wondering, uh, could you share with us uh, on the, the model where you have the full week off before Christmas, what does that do? You, you, other than shortening the, the, the fall s semester, what you're saying is they have less time to go through the material in order to be prepared for the exams before they go on, on, on break. Is that correct? Yes, if you were to take the same class um, in the first half of the year, you'd have uh, 10 fewer days to go through the material than if you took the class in the second half. And how, how would that impact a, a school like Vista that is on a block schedule? It, it would it feel like it, it would double it because you have double block periods. So in, at Vista del Lago, you're doing a year's worth of work in half of a year. And so it would be the equivalent of- uh, Losing 20 days? 20 days, or, or having 20 more days in the second term for a class yeah. than you would have in the first term. So they'll be super prepared for their finals in the spring semester. <laughs> or, or, or have a little bit too much time to fill. Yeah, yeah, all right, all right. Um, is there, uh, was there any discussion? I, I you know, I, I know uh, from the parents and, and, and obviously myself being one, um, you know, I, I know over, over the years we've, we've, um, fluctuated you know we've we've had some years where we, where we started the school year in august on a monday and other years that we start on a wednesday although we seem to have been locked in the last couple of years of, of starting midweek rather than at the start of the of, of, of the week which I, I i personally notice a tremendous difference in, in the students uh it seems like when they have a five full day start um it, it's a rough week um versus uh, starting midweek. But, you know, at, at the same time, I mean, I, I, I appreciate the struggle and the challenge here, given where Christmas and New Year's falls on a Sunday. Um, is there any, has there been any dialogue uh, about uh, December 23rd? Um, you know, I, I think it's it's very rough to expect that, I mean, a lot of people travel for, for, for Christmas in that week. And if they're getting out of school on the 23rd, I mean, you know, people are not gonna wanna be traveling on, on, on Christmas Eve. They, they wanna get where they're going. Is, has there been any discussion of, of maybe um, uh, ending school the week uh, on the 22nd of December and having Friday the 23rd as a holiday? Um, and how, and if we did that, what would that look like? How would, what would, how would that impact the calendar? Would it be a balance, would it be imbalanced? Well, we, we provided these uh, to give everybody a visual. So I'll give you an, an audio version of what okay. that would be. Okay, because yeah. I yeah. don't have a visual to share with you. Right. Um, if you were to look at draft B, just to maybe help people, you know, look at what we're, sure. how, I, how I would share this. Um, if I look at draft B, that closely resembles what you described. And then if instead of the 23rd being a school day, we made that green or, or said that is now not a, a non-school day, we would have to make that day up somewhere. Okay. So the question becomes, where do we put that day? So if we look in May, we really wouldn't want to do that because the last day of school on this calendar is on a Friday. We wouldn't want students to have to come back to school after a three-day weekend on a Tuesday. So it, you we can't put it there. Um, another thing we could do if we were going to if we were going to have an additional day off on the 23rd would be to look at October and perhaps not do uh, a professional development day on that day. That might be an option, and that's something that we've talked about. Another option will be to look at the start day and have a start day on the 9th for students 
Now, what we do with our staff is we have a, um, a teacher work day and we have a professional development day. We have two days that are paid days that staff come back, our teaching staff come back before the students. So right now, those are on the same week. If we were to put that day in the beginning of the school year and start the students on the 9th, what would happen then was we would have um, the 5th, the Friday the 5th would be the first day that staff, the teaching staff would be uh, contractually obliged to come back and work either as a work day or a professional development day. And so those days would straddle the weekend. One would be on the uh, Friday the 5th and one would be on Monday the 8th. So those are a couple of ways to make that, to achieve that. So, I mean, that, that, that is an option then. And I mean, yeah, it's, it's not a, I mean, at least we avoid, I hypothetically avoid uh, five days the first week. It's four days instead of five. Uh, I mean, obviously Wednesday has, has worked well, but um, obviously, you know, I mean, we have to make accommodations given the calendar. So it's an option. Any other board questions? Mr. President. Yes. I, I really like what um, Vice President Reed just said about the calendar and, and maybe moving that day back to have it start on the 9th. Um, my question is if we uh, maybe use that 22nd as the last day, um, how would we do a minimum day? I mean, because I know folks want to get out. I know they want to travel. Um, and maybe there might be an evening flight that they could fly out on the 22nd knowing that they have the 23rd off. Is that any way possible to do that? Yeah, our, our minimum make it a half a day? Are, are contractual. So, are they? And they're different between the different levels. So, uh, yeah, so it would be something we would have to go back and, and work with the, the bargaining team. Oh, with the bargaining team, okay. I mean, that's just a thought, but um, I would assume that you know, by the time we make a decision, I think it'll probably be next meeting uh, that you will have that other uh, is it draft B2 or however you want to word it, um, you know, so folks can have a visual of what it looks like. Okay. Any other? Uh, Mr. Huey. Yeah, just uh, thinking about state testing on this calendar too. Uh, we, we do have in our high schools, do we have standardized or state testing every year? How many, do you know how many days that tends to take up? I defer to Dr. Huber on that question. How many days that we test in the high schools for standardized testing? You know, it can really vary year to year because we often try different things in terms of trying to, you know, find that best practice, if you will, for students, not burning them out, not having them be you know, fatigued between tests, et cetera. Um, so I would say it, it could easily be three to four days um, over the course of a week where, where students are testing. It might even be a little bit more than that if they're trying to do smaller blocks of time mm -hmm. um, and extend it over further days. Uh, we have not talked about testing this year, so I'm not sure exactly what the schedule will be this year. Mm -hmm. But there is sometimes in the past where we've literally taken almost two weeks. Mm -hmm. um, by the time we break everything up. So it just really depends on kind of their approach. Um, we take student feedback, uh, teacher feedback in terms of trying to decide what's the best uh, schedule for testing. If it were that two week stretch, I mean, there's still, there are classes going on, instructions going on Absolutely. while testing's happening. Yeah. Um, so maybe <laughs> rough numbers here, three or four days. Yes. Um, if we were to look at the very imbalanced, you know, draft B2, um, it would be more like 85 days that first semester and maybe 92 the second semester rather than 96. In terms of you were the instructional about time. The, yes. Yeah, because I assume we would do the testing the second semester. Right. But also remember, it doesn't affect all the students. You know, not all the students have to take those, asses those assessments. Okay. Yeah. Um, wh which students would have to take them? So like the 11th graders are taking it. Um, it d d depends on the test too, in terms of like the science test is different grade levels. So uh, again, I'd have to get the schedules to, to break that out for you, but. Um, yeah, it's, it's grades different. three through eight and grade 11. Typically. Okay. At high school. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so in high school, we're really just talking about the one grade. That's exactly uh, right. Yeah. And e even if we took that into consideration, I'm still trying to figure this out for Vista. It, uh, it, we'd still be looking at, uh, in theory, what amounts to two weeks of of a difference between the first semester and second semester. Uh, in terms of the unbalanced it, schedule, right, yes. Right, right. It goes from 20 days maybe to 14 at, at right. best. Okay, thank you. Okay. Right. Any other board questions? No. Any? 
Yeah, okay. Yeah. A small question, but um, I was just wondering, how is the, is the day on October um, 10th just determined based on, like, in how much of a break there is in between, like, August and November? Well, like, historically, uh, there has been a holiday on that day. So, uh, so still some workers do have a holiday on that day. Um, we, don't, we, don't, we don't recognize it as a holiday, but that is a, that is a date that some workers do have off. And so in the past, that's why there was a day in October, and then it, it's, not a, it's not a recognized holiday now. So our staff has, uh, on some years, used that as a professional development day where the staff come to work, but the students get the day off. Okay, got it. Thank you. You're that's good for students. <laughs> okay, any other? Okay, we'll, we'll take this out to the public. Is there any public comment? Any virtual? No, Mr. Short. Okay, bring it back to board for final comments. If we have any final comments, only discussion item. Uh, Mr. President. Okay. Yeah, I'm just looking forward to seeing uh, at least another version of this calendar that will yes. reflect what we just talked about. And and Don, maybe I can count on you to work a little magic to see if there's something better that we can come up with. No pressure. Um, <laughs> Maybe there might be a, a fourth calendar that we could probably look at that may work out. So, thank you. Yeah, I'd concur with Mr. Reed's concerns and uh, obviously been hearing from a lot of families on this. So I'd like to see that extra option. Ditto, yeah, I've got a lot of emails on the same, same thing. So any other final? Okay, we're going to move on then. Uh, moving on to reports of education, Superintendent. Yes, I have a few acknowledgements this evening that I'd like to share during my report. Uh, we just concluded the fall season of sport for ma our male and female athletes, uh, middle school and high school uh, levels. I wanna thank our student athletes for their time, their commitment. I wanna thank our coaches for their time as well. And um, congratulations for all who finished this season and those that are going on into any playoffs or, or finals. My uh, second acknowledgement is again to a visual and performing arts team that performed Clue at Vista Del Lago this last two weeks. I had a chance to, to watch that performance and the students did an incredible job um, under uh, the direction of Mr. Hadley, their uh, drama teacher. And I know Folsom High's uh, production of Elf the Musical is coming up in the next couple of weeks. So looking forward to that as well. I again want to thank our Natoma Station students and climate coaches um, for sharing what they're doing in building a positive climate and relationships and um, the, the response of classroom training that they shared tonight I think is, is incredible. And when we hear it from the voices of students of how it's impacting them, I think is where we, we see um, really the, the integration of how SEL is um, showing itself in our schools and our classrooms and uh, great de demonstration of that tonight. And then I also want to acknowledge um, our employees, our certificated and classified employees. And I wanna make special recognition to our FCLA um, group, our certificated and classified leaders, our principals, our assistant principals. They work behind the scenes pretty tirelessly <laughs> And they've been filling in many vacancies um, since the beginning of the year, as have our, our other employees too. But without the team of all of our, our folks coming together, including those that have other jobs and responsibilities, uh, we wouldn't be able to do what we're doing. So I know uh, Dr. Daniels had called that out at our last uh, board meeting, and I just wanted to acknowledge the great leadership and the tireless dedication of our FCLA leaders as well. Thank you. Okay. Moving on to Board of Education business. I'll start with this. No, hold on. Let's start with Mr. Huey. Yeah, thank you. So just a couple of things. Uh, thanks for calling out some of those sports, Dr. Kuli. And I do want to congratulate the Vista Del Lago boys cross country team for winning the Capital Athletic League title. Uh, way to go boys, Th thanks Coach Grove for all your work, both of you, Coach Groves. Uh, you know, you put in a lot of early mornings and a lot of uh, wet runs. So uh, really proud of the team and all that they've done this year, including both Huey boys. Um, 
also just want to say really quickly, I, I mentioned during the Care Solace uh, portion of the night that I'm on a middle school campus every day as a mental health therapist. And as part of my job, I, I get to see all the work that everybody's putting in. I know this year is incredibly unusual. And I know on my campus, uh, all of the admin are doing every single job they possibly can on campus. I know that's the case in all of our campuses in FCUSD as well. So just wanted to give a special thank you to our admin who are filling in, subbing, being campus monitors, uh, watching people during lunch. I know you guys are going all above and beyond uh, what is really, uh, what probably you thought your job would be. Um, it doesn't go unnoticed. We really appreciate it. And the way that you're caring for our schools and our families, uh, just want to give you a thank you for that. Thanks. Thank you. Alice? Uh, yeah, sorry. Um, I don't have much to report out today other than um, about a week ago, I was I had the opportunity to uh, speak on the student panel for the School Safety Steering Committee. Um, so I just want to thank Mr. Meyer and thank Ms. Uh, Hazarian uh, for that opportunity. And um, I think it was really it was really a great opportunity for students. Um, and other than that, um, that's about it. So thank you. Thank you for participating. Mr. Clark. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, uh, last week, I had the opportunity to uh, visit Russell Ranch, Empire Oaks, Folsom Hill, uh, Gold Ridge Elementary, Cordova Meadows, Cordova Villa, Williamson Elementary, uh, and had the opportunity to uh, be sung to, be read to, uh, and even play PE with one class. And I tell you, at my age, I'm, I'm not going to do that anymore. I'll just stand out and observe. So, um, But anyway, I wanted to commend all the principals for all their hard work. I, With the exception of Russell Ranch and Ms. Cunningham, if you're listening, uh, I'll catch up with you and I'll see you again next year. Um, I had the opportunity to express my gratitude uh, for what they're doing and holding down the fort at their respective sites. Um, I also had the opportunity to attend the parent summit, and as uh, our, our president said, it, the infinity groups were great. I want to thank uh, Ms. Cabrera and, and Dr. Peace for facilitating that. Um, it was just great to hear the dialogue, a uh, great dialogue. Um, the only thing I wish we could do as board members is probably go from room to room and kind of check out the conversations of all the uh, infinity groups. I, I have a, a heart for our special ed kids and I, I kind of wanted to get in and, and hear the parents' comments on that. Um, Monday, or not Monday, next uh, Thursday is the uh, premiere of the uh, play at Folsom and I apologize to Vista for missing their, their play. Um, but ELF does start on November 11th. And um, I had a question for uh, Carrie Kay. With California's uh, positivity rate at 2.2, would you have any idea where we are as a county uh, as far as positivity rate? We're at 16.7 uh, as of today. And that's the period has said that we're at 5. Uh, you know what I was getting at then. I, you know, I just trying to advocate for, for no, no, for our poor students at, at Folsom. Um, I, I saw the challenge at Cordova and how hard it was uh, to speak to a mass doing a play. And and uh, there's one guy that I know who's actually uh, playing the role of Elf. Uh, he, he said, "I'm losing my voice because it's really hard." And it's like, yeah, I. You know, totally understand, but and I wish there was a way that we could kind of plead and and uh, at least, you know, with the audience being masked, uh, you know, how come the performers can't be unmasked if they are vaccinated or, you know, show a negative test? I don't know. I'm just throwing it out there. I just think the whole mask thing with uh, our students wearing masks, especially during a performing arts. I, it's just, it's really hard um, to perform with the mask on. You know, we're 
recognizing the social distancing. We're more than six feet away from them. And like I said, if they can do it at the Harris Center, if they can do it at the, what is that, the Safe Community Center for those who want to go see Hamilton or Officer and a Gentleman, um, I, I just think it could be done. But, you know, I can't argue with the county, I guess. Um, so anyway, I just wanted to put that out there. Uh, great presentation by Natoma Station. Um, I will be uh, making a visit out there, just for the record, for superintendent and the president Monday. Uh, and Monday, we'll, I will also be out at Vista Del Lago uh, to meet with their student council. Uh, and, um, oh boy, what's Kelly's last name? <laughs> um, Kelly Richardson and... Um, Rita Noguchi, who are respective parents at Folsom and uh, Vista. And I'm going to be meeting with their, their student council to kind of get a dialogue on the effects of fentanyl uh, and what it's doing to our students. So I will be making a visit out at Vista Del Lago um, on Monday to uh, check that out. And for all of our veterans out there, uh, from one vet to another, I just want to wish everyone a happy Veterans Day. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. Mr. Hoover. I'll be quick tonight. Um, I uh, look forward to seeing ELF uh, in a couple weeks. So I'm really excited about that. I am sad that I missed some of the other shows. Um, and uh, I believe... Mr. Clark, you're the expert on this, but I believe we've got some football playoffs. Oh, yeah. Right? So <laughs> excited for, for our uh, our teams as well. And, um, yeah, just uh, uh, thanks for the great discussion tonight. I, I think, um, you know, also um, we've obviously heard some challenges and continue to face hiring shortages and things like that. So I just want to say thank you to the staff who's working on uh, recruiting uh, just really talented people to work in our district and, I look forward to um, to getting uh, getting past these challenges one one of these days soon. And um, yeah, thanks. That's it for tonight. Thank you, Mr. Reed. I have no report this evening. Do you want me to make when Teresa, they, uh, when Teresa, they have nothing to say. <laughs> oh well. Anyway, um, I appreciate that, and I'll keep mine short because I'm at short, but. Uh, you know, attending the parent summit, I can't just say enough about the affinity groups and just kind of echo what Mr. Clark said. But uh, I do like the idea if we can absolutely cross talk. Uh, you know, but uh, I just want to say thank you again for that, and hopefully we can get more board members to at least you know drop in on that because it is really impressive. And so I'm really proud, and we are a great district for all the staff and everybody and what they do to really help everybody so i think it's just awesome uh, we did go to the ranch cordova state of the um, city last night uh well shaped great reception it was good to actually see some of the community members out that we haven't seen in a while because of covid quarantine but uh it was a good presentation we, it was good to see it and uh, a lot going on in ranch cordova as far as development going on a lot so um i think that's happening out in california wide here we're going the housing market the uh, and with the state of California type of, and this is made for Matt, you're going to see a lot of developments coming in with just massive, intense density of duplexes. I've seen some of that going on. It's new because the state doesn't require it as a zoning or ordinance. You can't stop it anymore. So we're going to, that means more kids, more people coming. So I, or I don't know where Matt is, but I don't know if you've seen some developments in the, in the areas here that are going that direction. But be prepared because that might mean more kids. Yeah. So we might have to update. So anyway, I thought that was interesting. And that's all I have to say for tonight. And um, I really appreciate everybody tonight. And where are we at? Uh, future meetings. Going on to future meetings. Uh, next board meeting is November 18th at the Education Service Center. So that's the only one. And then our 12th month calendar is there. If anybody wants to look, go look at it, it's there for informational. Any comments on that? If not, we can go to a motion for adjournment. Mr. President, I move. Got a first. Uh, I'll second. I got a second. Uh, take roll. Mr. Short? Yes. Mr. Reed? Aye. Mr. Hoover? 
Aye. Mr. Clark? Aye. Mr. Hui? Aye. Ms. Gao? Aye. Motion carries. Adjourned. Thank you.